time to talk about my favorite dashboard chart ever. This is something we actually use internally, by the way. It is the PyPI downloads chart for the Marimo Python package. You're looking at the weekly download numbers. You can also see we had this huge spike in October. For some reason, we had a lot of downloads from South Africa. We can't really explain why this happened. Another thing you can also see, and that allows me to show this other fancy feature. I can do this horizontal scrolling to really zoom in on this one time frame. And you can see that we had a bit of a slump during the holiday season. People were downloading Marimo less, but we are right on track. And the reason why you're able to see that we are right on track is because we are also making a prediction. That's this orange dotted line over here. Another fun fact about that prediction is that's something you can actually control as a user. So there's a slider over here. You can specify that you want that predictive line to be based on more historical data, or you can say that you want that to be uh, less the case. If you do that for the most recent data, you're gonna get a downward trend, which isn't entirely accurate, of course. So it makes sense that you're able to slide around here. But another big benefit of having a slider is that the person who's looking at this dashboard becomes more of a participant than just a observer. You are really, I might almost say forced, think about what you're doing when you're toying around this slider and that has an effect on the prediction going forward we're not just looking back at the history we're projecting forward as well over here so having this little interactive loop you know that uh, really helps you pay the right amount of attention and that's also why this is one of my favorite charts the point of this whole video is to explain how i've set this up because if you want to build something like this there's a lot of little details to just get right but the big hope of course is that by showing you all those little details you are better equipped to make charts like this uh, for your own organization or for your own projects as well so uh, let's dive into some of the details so first detail to get right the data set I've got a little helper function over here that lets me load some data that I'm uh, scraping on a daily basis. You can also see that I'm changing a column name. I'm also making sure that the date column is an actual date instead of just a string. And what you can also see me do is use this Polar's utility that lets me truncate on a weekly basis. This is a very useful function, but there is a consequence. And let me show you uh, by just looking at the resulting data frame so far. So again, we've got our date column, we've got our daily PyPI downloads over here. And then on the side right over here, you can see that we see a week amount. And the way to interpret this is that the first day of the week, uh, that is the day that you're gonna see over here. Um, and you can also see that eventually uh, we enter a new week over here. And that means that there is some sort of a cutoff over here. Now, where you put that cutoff, I mean, there's settings for it, but the downside Side of doing it this way where there is a hard cutoff for a week is that you do have these awkward weeks in the year that you want to guard yourself for. And in particular, whenever there's a new year, depending on the year in question, you might have this one week where, oh, there's a few days extra. And then you got to hope that that actually gets bucketed in the right week. And not only that, you also have this awkward phenomenon around February. Again, depending on the year, you might have more or less days in it. And that's not the only issue. You also get into this weird space where... If you have a chart like this, and if you really aggregate it on a weekly basis, they might also get this awkward thing where there's a week in the next bin, so to say. And let's say that today we've only got five days of that week binned. Well, then you got to write all sorts of logic to make sure that that week is either included or excluded, depending on how much data you've actually collected. And it gets brittle quite quickly. So instead, a thing that I really like to do in general is I like to apply a rolling sum instead. The thinking here is that on uh, this date, the 27th, I can look back to everything up until the 20th and I could just have a look at all the downloads so far and then I can put that as a sum as the PyPI number for that date and Polars has a really elegant way of declaring that. Uh, what you can do is you can just declare that you want to do a rolling aggregation. So you're going to say, hey, I want to do a rolling statistic based on the date. I want to have a period of one week that's going to look back uh, one week in particular. Think alternatively, what you could also do is you could put seven days in there and the numbers are exactly the same, but that's something you can also do. And then you can say, well, I want to aggregate that. It's kind of like following up after a group by and I want to take that PyPI column and then take the sum. And lo and behold, uh, when you do this, you just have a nicer data set to reason about because you're always going to look back at the sum of the last seven days, no matter where the date truncation splitting actually happens. So that's one thing that I always like to do when I make dashboards. I really prefer these rolling numbers as opposed to those binned ones. Then next up, the next detail you got to get right is this orange line. And because we are fitting a exponential curve, there is this old trick that you could do where, you know, I'm going to be predicting this Y variable over here. That's something I want to predict forward. But instead of predicting the actual value of Y, you can also take the logarithm of it. When you do that, you take a curve that is exponential, like this orange one, and you turn that into a linear straight line. And that's something that a normal scikit-learn regression can handle for you. 
Once you predict this term then, you can just take the exponential to move it back into this exponential form, but there is this trick that you can do to turn something that's inherently exponential into something linear, and that's called the log trick. So that is a thing that you gotta do. But besides that, the other thing that you wanna take care of are these outliers. There are just gonna be these periods where something weird is happening, that happens a whole lot in the time series domain, and you wanna be robust against that. So what could you do in that sense? Well, in that case, the thing that you can do is you can choose to not use a linear regression or a rich regression, but instead you're gonna go for a a Huber regressor. This is a scikit-learn model that is more robust against outliers. The way it works in short is it makes a distinction between points that are, you know, kind of around average behavior and is going to assign a different loss function to those than to data points that fall on the outside of it, so to say. So we're going to apply a squared loss for everything that's within a range sigma, so to say, and we're going to apply a linear loss for everything that's on the outside. And that way, by not squaring outliers, they're going to have way less influence. And that's what the Huber regressor uh, over here does. You can also see, by the way, that we are applying the log, as I mentioned before. But if you want to be robust against outliers, uh, this is why you want to use scikit-learn because they have estimators that can deal with that use case. So a uh, Uber regressor is great. It does wonders here. And it's also fast to train, which is amazing. So at this point, we have a good data set. We trained a machine learning model, and then we got to merge everything into a nice looking chart. And I could discuss all of the code that is written here. And it's a bunch of boilerplate, really. And there's a link in the show notes. So you can just copy the code as you see fit. There's just one little detail that I do think is worth mentioning. And that is that all the way at the end over here, there's this Altair chart that contains the actual data. There's this Altair chart that has the orange line. Uh, we also add some properties. We add a title. But at the end over here, I also declare that the chart is active. And I say that we are not going to bind on the y-axis. This is somewhat crucial when you're dealing with time series. Because by declaring it interactive, you can definitely still move this around, but you'll notice that we are clamping on the x-axis. That's the only axis where we can move into. We're not able to move it up and down. And if I were to zoom in, you can see that we're also only zooming in on that axis. And especially when you're dealing with time series, uh, that is just the bee's knees. Final thing that's worth mentioning now is how this slider relates to what you see over here. And a lot of that is really just uh, how Marimo works. So let me just declare a slider over here just for good measure. That's a slider right there. Let's assign that to a variable slider. And if I make a new cell down below over here where I check out the value of that slider, you'll notice that whenever I change the slider value, the cell down below updates automatically as well. And if I have a look at what you see over here, this cell output over here consists of two elements that we stack on top of each other. We've got the fit window and the uh, PyPI chart. And that fit window over here, uh, that's a slider that's defined somewhere else. There we go, it's a cell below. And whenever this variable updates, you can imagine that another variable somewhere else updates. And that entire chain of cells, well, that's all handled for you automatically with Marimo. You don't really have to change anything to get this behavior uh, right here, right now. And you know, there you go. It's not the most complex thing, but there are a few things you gotta get right. But once you do, you get a very nice, compelling chart that helps explain what's happening right now and what also might be the expected thing to happen in the future. And that combination, I think, is just a really, really pragmatic and also really, really powerful. One small detail and like fun fact, um, initially we actually tried making this with uh, Claude and this was kind of a nice example of where Claude got it wrong, especially around this predictive behavior over here. And, you know, uh, part of the story might be that we could have done a better job prompting. That's, you know, always the case. But having to apply the log function over here and then applying a regressor that is really robust against outliers, that is something where you still need a fair amount of domain knowledge and maybe even just some uh, programming savvy. Uh, so that was also like a fun little lesson that we learned. This was a uh, relatively simple thing to build. And despite that, still something that Claude couldn't really uh, zero shot or anything like that. This was still a little bit of manual labor. A final thing that's uh, worth mentioning is that everything that I'm using here is something that you can also use from Pyodide. So that means that theoretically at least, you could build all of this with a Git scraper inside of a Git repo, and you can actually have an automatically updating dashboard on GitHub pages. If that sounds interesting, there's a video that I'm linking right above over here that you can watch that explains how you can set that up yourself. Feel free to watch that, but I hope the main thing I've convinced you of is that you might want to start thinking about dashboards that behave a little bit more like this, where there's actually some interaction happening and that helps tell the story behind the data.